the Advanced Tech Podcast, providing a spotlight for innovators and disruptors. For links and show notes, and to find out how to sponsor the Advanced Tech Podcast, go to advancedtechmedia.org. You can also find and sponsor us on Patreon. If you're listening to us on iTunes, Google Play, or Spotify, please take a moment to subscribe and give us a rating. You can also sponsor us using Bitcoin at advancedtechmedia.org slash sponsor. Welcome to part two, people. So let's talk about Bitcoin. Let's. <laughs> so one thing I always like knowing is Bitcoin origin stories. So Hadlanad, if we can start out with you, what got you into Bitcoin and what keeps you here? Let's see. I mean, I think I was very much primed for Bitcoin before I discovered it. It was like, I was just waiting to find something like this. So the moment I discovered it, I was completely immediately down the rabbit hole from the first evening. I read the white paper the first evening I discovered it and I was just amazed. And it, I think it was the fact that digital scarcity was suddenly a thing that really got to me since I can very much relate to the Knut Svanholm article in Citadel 21 about like I grew up with copying computer games and uh, like laughing at all these kind of copy protections that were put on games that we easily bypassed. And suddenly with Bitcoin, uh, there was uh, bulletproof copy protection, <laughs> basically. And uh, the fact that there could only be 21 million of these things uh, just captured my imagination from the start. But I discovered it by chance, just was on the couch reading was some tech magazine i don't remember which one bitcoin was mentioned in some article and uh, i googled it and that was it basically I never looked back and katya uh, what about yourself i think i was primed for bitcoin as well just in probably in a different sense i studied economics in the university and uh, my least favorite subject was money because it was so hard to agree on everything they tried to teach us and uh, for me that was like kind of a problem. I was kind of that person that uh, had to stay <laughs> after the lectures and like talk to the teacher and stay with the teacher for another hour or two where like he or she tried to explain me all those uh, essences of money and uh, like in my head it just didn't add up and um, I discovered and then rediscovered Bitcoin like a few times throughout my life and I remember that my dad first mentioned it he was uh, super excited about the like the digital money and back then it was uh, super early like probably 2009 and he said uh, that he was so excited and i remember he said that yeah like uh, what we have to do now is to find a way how to properly store this money and uh, yeah it basically took uh, so many <laughs> years before actually like uh, some proper way of storage was developed in the space but I mean, at that time, uh, I was studying at the university and uh, I thought that this is really cool, but I, did, I didn't want uh, to dig deeper into. But uh, I'm just happy that uh, once it clicked in my head, I guess, when it was uh, the right time. And I thought that, yeah, this is actually cool that uh, we can have uh, money that are separate from the state. And I guess for me, this is the most important thing that... I see in Bitcoin, I just uh, really like this idea that uh, we can have our, like basically our own money and that we control them and uh, like that there is an aspect of scarcity and basically everything that fiat system currently struggles with, Bitcoin solves it and it solves it for good. And uh, I guess also basically one of the reasons we started Citadel 21 as well is because it's not only the thing that can fix like the practical issues, uh, like the broken fiat money system, but also it adds a lot like to the culture, like the culture in a sense that it can basically shift the way you think, as we see on Twitter in everyday life, that Bitcoin works like not only for your everyday life, but also for <laughs> your way of thinking. And I guess that's really helpful in today's world. As you said, it's going mad. And I think it's really cool that we have Bitcoin. Yeah, just, just this feeling that we finally we have a sane and true foundation that we can build on. And 
when when you realize the insanity of the the fiat system, basically the insanity of inflation and money printing, then you get frustrated and it feels kind of hopeless because everything is based on the system and we have these gatekeepers who control the money and then any kind of meaningful change is basically impossible and anything we build on top of the system is will always be subject to manipulation from the bottom layer and uh, for the first time we now have a really sound foundation so now we can start to build really sound stuff on top of it yeah you're right the we do have finally a, a, a foundation that we haven't really had i mean if you look at the world the world itself is almost fake in uh, all the systems yeah. that we you know were guided by and it's been really strange um, the last few years seeing all of our institutions that were supposed to last forever you know see them pretty much all crumble and then you look into root causes why and you realize it's you know it's not because you know people didn't try hard enough it's because the system itself was actually broken so it's interesting to see Bitcoin, you know, it's built, uh, it's built on rules, not rulers. And I think it's really interesting. Yeah. All the, all the blood vessels and the incentive structures to the, to all parts of the, of the old system, all of those vessels led to the, to the fiat system and fiat money was pumping through the vessel. So obviously the, the organism, the old institutions were basically doomed to fail. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So, Carol, we're talking about Bitcoin origin stories. What got you into Bitcoin and what keeps you here? Oh, the money. It was the money in the beginning. In 2016, one of my furry friends gave me 0 0.3 Bitcoin and I blasted away onto clothes. <laughs> and then for like a year, I didn't give a damn. And then in 2017, I was stupid enough to go and buy Ripple. And then I got wrecked with it. And then I started going down the rabbit hole. And then I kind of discovered Bitcoin. And then ever since 2018, I'm here, kind of. And I kind of like totally sold on the whole revolutionary aspect of it. That, you know, like money can exist outside of the, uh, the government system, like outside of reach of state and whatever. And... And it, this kind of mesmerized me that uh, this is like really revolutionary thing in the world that you cannot copy this money. You cannot do, you, it totally ends uh, counterfeiting of money. We weren't able to solve that for like thousands of years. Nobody managed to solve it. One guy, Satoshi Nakamoto, finally did it. He finally did it. It's, <laughs> it's fascinating. And this whole thing just keeps me here like a magnet, keeps my mind running 24-7. I kind of have to rehabilitate myself, basically. <laughs> so yeah, that's <laughs> the whole thing with, with the rehab thing. <laughs> well, that makes sense, the title of your show, then. Yeah, we can say so. <laughs> so one thing we should probably talk about. So this week, and uh, it might be a couple of weeks ago from when, uh, when this is posted. So the banks in the U.S. have just greenlit custodial storage of cryptocurrencies. Um, I know where I stand on this, but I'd love to get your feedback on this decision. I really didn't hear about that. So that's like the news for me now. But honestly, I would not trust <laughs> custodial solutions. So I guess uh, if you have Bitcoin, it's better to store it yourself. And thankfully today we have all the means to do that. Of course, there are people who would like to use custodial solutions and uh, I understand where they're coming from. But I guess like the one of the ideas that Bitcoin teaches us is to be like self-sufficient. And if that's our own money, not controlled by anyone, then we shouldn't use custodial solutions and uh, learn how to manage our money ourselves. Yeah. I read uh, briefly about this today and... Uh... I can't really get excited about it, to be honest, and I can't really make myself form a strong opinion on it even. It's basically like, yeah, this is great for Bitcoin. And if the opposite news came out, that would be great for Bitcoin. Everything is great for Bitcoin. Bitcoin really doesn't care. And uh, they're just desperately trying to be relevant and further the illusion of them having relevance, which they very soon will not have at all. So... I don't know. It's probably 
I would guess good for maybe it will just somehow change the adoption curve or change the price curve or something. It it should be bullish for the price, I would think. It should be like medium term, but if we if we think ten years ahead, twenty years ahead, it really doesn't matter at all. Yeah. Kara, what are your thoughts on this? Hmm. I don't know really. Well, it's uh... What was the question again? I was distracted. For a second. <laughs> okay. Get if, off. Uh, get yeah. off those furry websites, Caro. I mean, <laughs> like, can, can't you stay off them for like one, one it, happens, uh, it happens more often at night, so trust me on this one. <laughs> oh my. <God>. Okay. So <laughs> you didn't get the question. <laughs> yeah, the question was the question was which furry website are you on right now? <laughs> Not to get this on Twitter. <laughs> but I'm missing it. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> what about you, Alexandra? What do you think, Tori? Yeah, so I mean to me it's I think it will help educate people that there's a thing called Bitcoin. And, you know, at the same time, though, it's not really news. You know, like you said, it's just because the banks will now allow you to hold cryptocurrency. I mean, that's that's good. Um, you know, it's not seen as this this dark money as uh, as it used to be uh, perceived as, even though it's, it's not. Yeah, I don't know. It's a weird thing because I think as Bitcoiners, we've been taught to become self-sufficient and the fact that you know we don't need institutions to hold our money for us and for the most part people don't you know if they put in the time to understand like it's you don't need the authorities to take care of you any longer Um, you can be perfectly self-sufficient and self-sovereign and so I think you know it's it's interesting but ultimately it's almost like a it's an interesting headline but yeah I don't think it'll affect bitcoin overly one thing I am concerned about, though, is you're starting to see reporting between uh, exchanges that do the KYC, like Know Your Customer, and financial tracking, uh, like Coinbase and, and other institutions. Um, so I think the more you, the more money you put into a controlled system, the more you're going to be controlled. The ability to control you is always going to be there. So if you want true freedom, be your own bank. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's fascinating, also, like you know the aspect. With with custodial things because now we introduce in the the fractional reserve Bitcoin into the picture. Yeah, I mean uh, that's that's a very good point. I remember back when the the Lightning Trust Chain was a thing, and uh, you had these these fractions in the community which were very negative to all custodial solutions, Lightning solutions, and I was always of the opinion that they served the purpose and they were good for adoption of Lightning because they were really easy to to onboard people to and what i saw happening a lot at first hand like you know discussing with all the people that held the torch along the way what i saw was that they initially used a custodial solution but then they were so amazed by and interested in the lightning network that they started educating themselves and then they graduated to non-custodial solutions so i think maybe banks are like a macro version of this that it could potentially legitimize and introduce huge numbers of people to Bitcoin. And then after a little while, they will start thinking or start educating themselves on Bitcoin. And then they will think, why the fuck am I letting my bank custody my Bitcoin? Uh, so I think we may see a similar thing happening there. Yeah, I guess that may be, uh, may be true in a lot of aspects because i uh, just remember from my marketing experience i used to research like the space and the audience a lot and like the perception of the people towards money system and towards banking solutions and stuff like that and i remember it was like a research made by the agency uh, i worked back then and it was uh, really interesting like the first numbers it was um, three years ago and actually, people like sixty percent of people said that that, um, that banks are outdated, and thirty uh, percent of uh, the respondents, and uh, they were actually mostly millennials, and they were sure that Bitcoin or other cryptocurrency will take over the fiat system. So, 
I guess that's an interesting trend because people like get more and more mad on banks because um, like also from that report, what I saw is that people do not really understand what, what they pay for because like having an account in bank costs you money. And then you pay all the kinds of uh, strange fees for making like any transaction and stuff like that. So I guess people start more and more to realize things about the fiat system and the banks. And uh, looking at those responses like three years ago, I think that's um, a really cool start and probably like it it develops in some kind of uh, trend that people actually start to trust banks less and less and uh, actually what we see in like financial solutions like bankless finance i would call it like that that uh, you can have some sort of financial bank account but without an existent bank itself so i guess that probably represents uh, the trend so maybe in future we will we will really see how the banks uh, fall apart not only because of bitcoin but also because people are getting tired of that shit well said. Yeah. I remember a time when um, you actually got interest on your, your savings and checkings account. And now, you know, it's completely the reverse. We, we pay for the privilege of somebody else holding our money for us, which uh, is completely ridiculous. Yeah. The banks figured out fees. And now <laughs> there are so much fees that they got addicted to fees. They have to keep <laughs> deducting all the overdraft charges. <laughs> and all those dollars and I don't know what the hell ever. Yeah. All the fees. And then, you know, they close you out of the system. Then you have to go to checking, check cashers or, or money landers or payday loans in the U.S. It's just terrible there right now. Yeah, exactly. Actually, one thing that probably bothered me the most in regards to banks is that as long as you have your money in the bank, they can use it at their own like purpose. Like basically the money you don't use like currently right now they can use it like to lend to someone or to do some other stuff they need for their own restructurization because all you see in your account is just numbers and not the actual money so it always like really bothered for me that you actually like it's your money but like sort of your money but you don't really own own them so, fake money yeah <laughs> fake bank money yeah. numbers that you exactly. imaginarily own on a bank account but it's actually the banks and then it puts <laughs> it into interest interest bearing accounts and oops it's gone <laughs> <laughs> and it's gone <laughs> <laughs> yep <laughs> yeah that's one of the best memes that and it's gone from south park <laughs> yeah yeah it's pretty good <laughs> I might actually include a link to that in the show notes. Do it. <laughs> totally do it. <laughs> I will. I will find it. I hope it's not copyrighted, but uh, I guess it's short enough that even if it was, it would be fine. 20 seconds only. <laughs> cool. All right. So we've talked about Bitcoin. What are some of the interesting things that you're seeing emerge in the Bitcoin space uh, that you think merits research and, and further study or that you're excited about? Hmm. I'm uh, uh, I'm very bullish on Bitcoiners, basically. Uh, I think uh, the bar of the average Bitcoiner is being raised all the time, and um, like when I listen to podcasts, like every podcast I listen to, Bitcoin podcast, I'm I'm always so Im impressed by the people, and I think just the the organic development of the space in general is like what what excites me the most right now. Uh, I mean, of course, uh, what Jack Mallers is doing, I think is especially interesting and maybe also BTC Pay Server. I really love what those guys are doing. But uh, I'm just uh, very, very, very bullish on Bitcoiners and what we are doing as a movement. Um, yeah, what I'm excited about, I was thinking about this. Not sure if you heard about this project called Citadel 21. <laughs> <laughs> Super excited about that one. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but yeah, I agree with Hodlonan that uh, probably the biggest thing I'm always excited about is people. And it's so cool. Like what I enjoy the most is probably like to hear and uh, read those like basically rebirth stories 
about people like when they tell like yeah in past it was this and then i uh, discovered bitcoin and now i'm this and this and i'm thinking like this and like how their life changed and this is really pretty exciting for me because like i always imagine like okay we're such like a small community if i don't uh, okay if I, i call it community but such a small amount of people who are into bitcoin but what if this thing like scales like drastically because currently like less than one percent of people actually like are into any sort of cryptocurrency but then i imagine okay what if like half of the population is actually into bitcoin then then what like how it if it changes like the life of one person drastically then what if it changed like the lives of millions like then what how our world will look like probably it will drive some other like uh, core changes to the world and how we live so that's kind of exciting for me cool wouldn't it be ironic if that one percent would become the new one percent <laughs> that one percent like it just reversed and then really somehow <laughs> that they're kind of kind of ironic also because then we would be the super ultra rich yeah and then there would be another middle class and then some sort of a social shift but i guess i mean i would totally trust bitcoiners better uh managing society and and turning everything around into a sound money system than than the current government and everything that's running the world right now, this current Illuminati or whatever it is. And then probably a Bitcoin takeover will be much more useful for society than what is going on now. Yeah, I've always been of the school that absolute power corrupts absolutely. But I think the minute you remove uh, money from government, like the separation of money and state, uh, I think it's it's more possible to... I hesitate to use the word utopia, but... You know, every every new ruler thinks that they'll be the best ruler and they'll be the kindest and fairest or most fearful or or whatever. You, but until you're actually there, I think it's impossible to comment. But it would be interesting. You know, what I really appreciate about Bitcoin is the fact that it empowers individuals. And it's not like, a, you know, you must trust and follow the, the leader. It's now, you know, what's in your heart? Trust that and move forward according to that and according to your integrity and your principles. And I think that that really creates a much more interesting and honest society. And is everybody going to be motivated like that? Probably not. Uh, a lot of people will still always be interested in like, what can I get out of everything versus what can I contribute? But I, I think if we're able to shift that so that um, there is value in giving back and there is value in just following your intuition and following what uh, you really want to do in the world, Um, and there's a way to not necessarily make money, but get value out of that versus um, you've got to slog, you know, 40 to 60 or 80 hours a week and uh, get a corporate job that is super unfulfilling. Um, yeah. You know, it used to be that used to be the only path to freedom. And then eventually you do that for a number of years and then retire. And uh, I think that's definitely not the only path now. And I don't think it was a healthy path to begin with anyway. Feels to me like Bitcoin is this massive meteorite that just smashed down on Earth and it's now lying there, like just glowing and smoldering and like the chimpanzees are crowding around it trying to make sense of what it is. But it, now it's here and it will continue to be here. And we really have no idea of what it will do and what it will make possible also in how we organize ourselves. And because it makes so many things possible and we discover new facets of it all the time. And in my opinion, we haven't even started to like study or understand how it can affect uh, societal structures and possible future organizations. Just the fact that we now have completely sound money that is not uh, owned by any nation. I mean, it could potentially make possible new forms of clusterized organizations in society just because we have a money that's completely apolitical and uh, neutral. So the sky is the limit for what can potentially happen. And uh, I'm really interested to see how humanity will continue to feel out and think about this uh, space rock that has landed uh, in our midst. Yeah, I guess like I was thinking what you Caro said about like the one one percent, 
And I'm thinking, like, just looking at the Bitcoiners we see today, it seems like they're actually not prone to, like, being the new government. It's, like, the opposite of what uh, we see is probably that people want... They are not against of organizing, but they're kind of against of to having someone, like, on top. So I guess, yeah, like Hodlonot said, it's, it's uh, really interesting how it will evolve. But uh, I really have this uh, long idea, which I hope, uh, because I think it's cool, (laughs) which I hope we will see in the future, is some sort of decentralized societal clusters. It's basically like citadels. And it's really interesting if the amount of people who are into Bitcoin will become bigger. It's really interesting. It would be interesting to see, will we actually be um, organizing in those citadels and how it will work? So, yeah, I guess it's either like becoming the 1% or either becoming something else. And I'm thinking that probably like just thinking about the nature of Bitcoin and the way people think who are into Bitcoin, I would see maybe something else like the evolution of a societal structure. Yeah. Yeah, we're essentially, we're just over 11 years in. Uh, over or under. <laughs> We're just at 11 years into uh, the new world and not the new world order, but the new world. And that just opens up so many possibilities. You know, we fixed the money. Has it like fully fixed? No, but we definitely have a good head start. And, you know, from there, uh, every possibility is, is open. Yep. Okay. <laughs> so we've talked about Bitcoin and society. Uh, what else do we want to cover? Hmm. I really don't know. Uh, we even talked about furries, so that's <laughs> that's check. <laughs> um, well, I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know as well. I might actually keep that part in. Uh, some of this, the conversation, I'll, I'll cut out. But uh, that was <laughs> that was good. <laughs> actually, actually, wanted to ask you: Are you going to? It will be an interesting question. <laughs> Are you going to any conferences this year? Like, I know that all of them closed, but still there are some, like, for example, HCPP. Are you considering to go there? I am, actually. So I submitted a, a talk. Um, oh. If it's if it's there, if it's mm-hmm. in person, definitely. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, well, we'll see. I, I don't know how long it takes for the, the CFP process. Uh, but even if my talk doesn't get accepted, I'd like to go. I've always wanted to go. Yeah, that's a cool place. And you, Caro, will you be there this year? I also submitted a, a piece of presentation. I'm kind of waiting for their judgment on it. I don't know if they're going to accept it, but I'm hoping they're going to do it. So, yeah, probably. Uh, and, and are you two coming? Uh, we actually, yeah, we want, we really want to come. Um, Amazing. Yeah, I actually have one more question for you, Caro. Will you bring the chocolates? Yes, I will bring more than one <laughs> this time. <laughs> just <in time. laughs> the, the tumbler is not going to appear. Yeah, it's just we have a story with Caro that we uh, were chatting and we like said, yeah, let's uh, catch up during the conference and like uh, say hi. And he brought, uh, like we met and he said, yeah, I brought you chocolates. Like next time I see you, I will win them. And then like the next day, like he asked me, like, did you like the chocolates? And I was like, uh, which chocolates? And he said, well, I gave you chocolates yesterday. And I was confused because he didn't. And Oops. <laughs> and in the end, it appeared that like he saw, he saw me and I was not even wearing a mask, but he confused me with some other girl and he gave her chocolates and she was happy and I was not. <laughs> so that was really funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i'm just going to http to get the chocolates that's the only reason <laughs> thanks <laughs> yeah chocolate for everyone <laughs> can i have some chocolates as well of course of course he's gonna bring a fucking backpack full of chocolate <laughs> thanks man <laughs> good times so yeah, I'd be curious to see what conferences happen. I'm gathering that Baltic County Badger isn't happening this year. Um, I haven't seen any updates on the channel. Yeah, it's like super close. 
Yeah. yeah. It's really yeah. so sad. This is so sad yeah. that all this. Uh, I feel so bad for Bitcoin Magazine that uh, yeah. their conference was canceled and just sucks. Yeah. I'm curious if, I guess we don't really know how, you know, how events are going to play out. Um, I'm really hopeful that conferences are back. I have a feeling they probably won't be fully back until, you know, next, like February, March. Um, if it's sooner, that would be great. But yeah, it's certainly changed the way, like, you know, I'm used to going out to a few different conferences and uh, a few different times a year. The fact that it's switched to virtual, I mean, it's good that you still have that connection point, but it's so much better to, you know, I love the fact that you can travel and, you know, you can go to a conference yeah. and speak and you've got kind of an anchor, you're doing something there and you're connecting with people. And then, you know, you've got time to like go and like <laughs> see the, you know, see the new places. And yeah, I don't yeah. know. It's a much... Get some chocolates. Get some chocolates. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a much, <laughs> it's a much uh, deeper way to connect uh, totally. It's, uh, it's, it's so cool to have had uh, interactions with people for months or years uh, online and then meet up and, you know, get the personality, the full personality and the face to the... To the person you knew online, I, I really love that. And uh, I look forward to going to more conferences when it's possible. Yeah, hopefully hopefully that is soon. Uh, I guess we'll find out. Yeah. What else do we want to talk about? Do you want the, the fully chocolate one or do you want the normal <laughs> or the vanilla one? Because um, there are three or four flavors. Okay, what was the first one? I think there is some um, strawberry, then there is vanilla, normal chocolate, and double chocolate. The one you didn't get was a double chocolate, actually. Okay. Oh, then it's good because I want strawberry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I I I'll do my best. <laughs> Thanks, Car Carol. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think if there's anything else we should cover. When will Citadel 21 going to be on the Bloomberg Terminal? <laughs> <laughs> We're actually talking to Bloomberg like about some kind of partnership. So hopefully <laughs> soon. <laughs> yeah, we, we just think that Bitcoin voices need to be like appropriated by some like really curated yeah, publication. It's, it's about yeah, like <laughs> oh, this is why Bitcoin at one thousand dollars and quickly shorted. <laughs> yeah, that's basically what the community is lacking. We need to be like filtered by, by the some responsible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We need definitely need more authorities for sure. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and really, the the big question is when Citadel Twenty One IPO. <laughs> 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 <Don't consider. laughs> no, no, not not ICO. <laughs> Public oh, offering, no. IPO. <laughs> <laughs> Bitcoin Citadel Twenty One Vision. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Will probably be quite a while. Yeah. Fair enough. Good. I think we're, we're turning this into the rehab episode now. <laughs> Uh, good times. One thing we should definitely close on. Um, I always like closing on a question. So do any of you have questions for the Bitcoin community or for listeners in general? Um, and if so, what would those be? Hmm. One moon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm pulling a blank right now. Maybe it's because I have a temperature or something. I'm not sure. But uh, maybe, maybe mm. my question would be be if they are uh, if they are able to and if dare to express themselves honestly and uh, and be real like to i think that's so important in these times to to have a voice and to not bend the knee to all this insanity we're seeing around us yeah so that's something I try to do at least, and the uh, question I ask myself a lot: If I'm, am I actually keeping it real right now? And uh, I try as hard as I can to do that. Yeah, that's one of the things that I appreciate about your stances on a lot of things on Twitter. 
um, is you don't filter your voice. And you can see that across in Citadel 21 as well, is that there's there's not really much of a filter, and I don't think there needs to be, you know, like we've discussed yeah. already. For people that are having trouble finding their voices, or who might actually be in a situation where it could be dangerous if they, they share their voice, what would you suggest, where could they potentially start? Maybe Maybe start by having a pseudonymous uh, voice to at least because I totally sympathize with the fact that it's it's not possible if you have a family and you have you're providing for someone uh, it's not responsible to lose your job and that's that's a horrible predicament to be forced to basically be silenced to have your voice silenced because you have to provide and you will potentially lose your job I think a lot of people are silenced because of fear of social repercussions. And my advice to them would basically be to find new friends. Like if you if you can't, if you're not comfortable or if you're afraid of the consequences in your social group by you expressing your opinions, uh, that's just a road to unhappiness in my opinion. You, you need to find friends that resonate or at, at the very least are able to handle your opinions. Uh, so... Find the, the maximum point of uh, honesty you can have in your life and live by it and uh, strive for more all the time. Very cool. Caro, any following uh, thoughts or questions for listeners or things you'd like to impart? I got two questions. One more bit dramatic, since we know we are in this bipolar world already, which side you are on. And the second one is a bit more funny, but <laughs> are you a Bloomberg subscriber? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we are, but we got it for free. <laughs> yeah. And uh, regarding the, what was the first question? Which side? Uh, actually, this this question is for the viewers. Like, oh. which side you are on? You know, this <laughs> ninjas or bananas? <laughs> okay, sorry. I thought this question's for us. Yeah, which side are you on, Carl? Are you a ninja or are you a banana? I'm the third category. Mm. I'm the uh, space dragon, doing fancy stuff. <laughs> fancy stuff with ninjas and bananas. Oh yeah, I'm just like. Eating the popcorn, basically. Yeah. But I'm not really. I mean, th this thing with the ninjas and bananas is really complicated. And I sincerely, I love love ninjas also. And I met the bananas also in real life you know, twice. Mm -hmm. And their leader also. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I can't say I hate them. I don't hate them. No. And I'm not going to attack them at all. I'm not going to. I don't think anyone so, here hates anyone. In yeah, this, in this. nobody hates anybody, in my opinion. And nobody should attack neither of them. I mean, some, some in the space totally hate each other over this, but... Uh, I don't yeah, think, I know. I don't think that applies to any of us. But anyways, I think your article was cool, and I think it was also cool to see the reactions to it and the discussions and interactions oh, yeah. that came out of those reactions. I think it's healthy that... You know, this this beehive is poked a little here and there, and it's allowed to, I don't know, to vent out some steam out of it and and create some discussions. And the discussions that we had today, I kind of think they almost bridged the conflict a little, maybe. Uh, it, it, it felt kind of okay, the whole thing in the end. You know, you know actually, I'm going to change side here. <laughs> I'm going to join the Bloomberg <laughs> Uh oh, that sounds Same dangerous. <laughs> One thing we should talk about is um, so, so Carol, for people that haven't read your article or maybe haven't had some questions, could you explain ninjas and bananas and the concept? They are they are really fierce warriors of privacy who fight for your your rights in the in the world outside. They try to protect you against the overreach of government and they try to somehow bridge that in order to bring about a more fair world. So I, I will support their work and I'm just going to close with this one because 
I'm totally not attacking them. I'm totally in support of their work. And I would really love to see their project just cooperate and create an even better one. Because I think the only true that can achieve the, the fulfillment of uh, what Bitcoin is about to bring. Yeah. And, and, and just to disable, I mean, just to you know, abolish all this KYC, LM bullshit. To be clear, uh, I think Alexandra wanted you to like make clear what ninjas and bananas refer to, which is. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Samurai I, I would just and, say it. Uh, yes. Samurai wallet and wasabi. Yes, exactly. Yeah, like the coin, yes. the coin join, uh, the mixing technologies. Yeah, definitely a polarizing. Um... I guess definitely polarizing and I'm trying to think if I can add anything to that. And I don't think so. <laughs> All right. So how can people find you? Uh, let's start Hodlonaut and Katya and then Carl. Yeah, I can be found as Hodlonaut on Twitter and uh, me and Katya's project Citadel 21 can be found as uh, CTDL21 on Twitter and uh, citadel21.com uh, is the website. Uh, you can find me as Bitcoin Katya on Twitter. And you guys can find me as BTC Dragon Lord and my channel <laughs> Bitcoin Rehab. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> now take the orange pill right now. I really orange liked pill. the first episode, Caro. It was cool. Look forward to more episodes. Thanks, man. <laughs> Yeah, good job. Good job. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, it'll be probably a couple of weeks before this goes out, but I will get it out as soon as possible. And Kira, I will uh, I will share this with you as well if you want to share on your channel. Yes, I'm totally pumped about it. Cool. <laughs>